Good morning. Welcome to Grace Church. Happy New Year to each one of you. And uh, if I can say this without being flip or, or trite or sacrilegious, man, is it good to be back with you guys. Uh, we missed you immensely uh, while we were gone this past week. Enjoyable time with our family down in the great state of Ohio. But uh, I, my pastor at our previous church before coming here, always said when he would come back from vacation, he said, man, we missed you. And I was like, okay, great. It didn't, but I felt it a whole lot more this, this time now. And so it's, it's great, great to be with you and great to see you all again. It's good to be home, very much so. Uh, excited to worship the risen Christ with you. And thus I say to you as your pastor and your brother in the faith, he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. If he is not, as Paul says, your faith is in vain. If he is not risen, we have no hope. So let us remember our hope and remember our faith as we worship the risen Christ today. Just by way, a couple of announcements. Uh, we will have the CE hour afterwards. And as I promised before we left, we are going to be looking at a few of the ecumenical creeds of the early church, the Apostles, the Nicene, the Chalcedonian, and the Athanasian. Don't worry, it only took them 500 years to put those together, and we'll cover them in 50 or 55 minutes. Just kidding. Uh, but I, I urge you to stay. This is a very important part of our faith, and I think very, very helpful with several of the questions that we have bumped into in the book of John. And I've been wanting to do this for a while, and so we will take the CE hour and look at these. Uh, I have copies printed off for you, so look forward to uh, studying uh, more about our faith with you in the next hour. A Wednesday night is prayer meeting, 6.30 to 7, and look forward to seeing each of you there. Um, and I think that's... No. Also, uh, we print off kids. This announcement is for you specifically. Uh, we print off coloring sheets every week for you that correspond with the sermon, and I always print enough for everybody here, but not every week is everybody here. So I've got several extras, and I just put them in my office, and now I've got a stack of them, okay? So on the table back by the water fountain, the water cooler, is a stack of papers. Take as many as you want. They're ones we've already used. We're not going to use again, and if you're inside this week and it's too cold to go outside, grab a crayon, and you may color to your heart's content this week, okay? So those are sitting back there on the table, uh, please grab some of those as you leave. Also, uh, we are going to be blessed today. Uh, Don Deal is going to be preaching the word to us for the sermon. He graciously uh, offered, uh, helped me as I'm coming back from vacation, and so I'm very, very thankful to him for that. And so in your bulletin, you do have an extra piece of paper. As you can see, Don is a bit more detailed than myself, okay? Okay. So you have that uh, help with you for the sermon, uh, so that is there as well. And then we do have a couple of songs. We have one of our former hymn of the month, and then uh, that we'll sing. So you have an insert for those as well, which are noted in the bulletin. Let me just read a few verses for our call to worship here today before we begin worshiping Jesus Christ. This comes from Psalm 87, which says this, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. Yahweh loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. This is a psalm celebrating the city of Jerusalem, not because Jerusalem is inherently better than any city on the planet, but because it is and will be home to the king of kings when he comes and rules here on earth. And so Jerusalem has always played an important part throughout human and sacred history, and it will one day uh, be the throne location of Jesus Christ. And so we, this psalm celebrates that. And let me ask you this. What's the difference between an adequate meal and a glorious meal? An adequate meal gets the job done, does it not? It could be peanut butter and jelly. It, 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 there you go. 
A glorious one, you might have to stretch a little bit at the end. A glorious one you will tell others about. An adequate one just did the job, nothing special about it. One of our hymns that we're singing, our second hymn, is glorious things of thee are spoken. It speaks of the glories that are those are there for those who trust in Christ. The last verse of the hymn is one of my favorite in all hymnology. Where it concludes and it says, uh, Savior, if of Zion city I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. We worship the glorious God who has made glorious promises for his children. These are not joys that you might whoop and holler about for a few days and then forget. These joys are, in the strictest sense of the word, infinite. They last beyond all that you will ever face in this life or the next. And so, worshiping this God requires us to give our absolute best. And it requires a a heart that is fully engaged, fully in love with, fully submitted to our great God. And so I hope that you have taken time to prepare, and I'm going to pray to give us one last moment to do so, but let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts to sing to our great God today. Father, you are glorious. There is none like you. There is no joy compared to the joy of knowing you. So Father, help us please. Help us to rid our hearts of the idols that we produce so frequently. Help us to toss these cheap trinkets aside and cling to the solid joys and lasting treasures that you and you alone provide. Father, we worship you. We worship your Son, the risen Christ. We worship your Spirit. Three in one, Holy Trinity. Father, we we bow our hearts before you. Receive our worship from pure hearts as we celebrate Uh, who you are, and what you've done. Bless our worship now today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And just by the way, I probably should put one more announcement so it doesn't uh, fill your thinking too much. Uh, We are not redecorating up here, uh, but I am told this will be applicable uh, during the sermon. So I am just as in the dark as you. Everyone's in the dark except for Don Deal. But let that not distract you now. We will stand with me if you would. Turn in your hymn books to hymn number 364. Hymn number 364, How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord.
promise of your Savior, Church, that soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. There's some encouragement in that one, is there not? Turn to hymn number 425 for our next hymn. Hymn number 425, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, we'll wait on our ushers for the morning offering, and uh, they'll hang on to the plates. You're welcome to set your offering in there if you like. If you're not comfortable with that, we do have an offering box in the back out the door. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Creator God, giver and sustainer of life, we owe everything that we have everything that we are to you. We cannot pay you back were we to have a thousand ages to do so. And so we don't try. Father, we want simply to respond with joy, with gratitude for who you are and what you've done. Father, may our hearts fill to overflow with worship. May you be pleased to receive even these meager gifts for you. Father, use them, please, uh, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Otsego and the surrounding areas and around the world. Father, we pray for our missionaries, the Flinks, as they serve down in Chile. We ask that you would bless them and bless their ministry down there as they seek to start a new work, um, as you have blessed and sustained the original one. Father, we think of the Dukes who are not with us today as uh, the time draws near for uh, Emily to give birth, and we pray that you would protect her and the little one, and we ask that you would uh, allow for a safe and healthy delivery. Father, we thank you for the many ways you've answered prayers, for bringing us back, for sustaining us through another year. Father, we don't know what 2021 will, will bring us. We know that you will be with us. 
We know that you will never change, and we know that we have solid joys and lasting treasures in you. So, Father, help us to yearn for your kingdom. We are yet another day closer, and I may that fill our hearts and stir our purpose. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charity. Take your hymnals one more time, and you may remain seated. We'll sing hymn number 17. Hymn number 17, O Father, You Are Sovereign. Hymn number 17.
Amen. Thank you for your good singing. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 4. If you're following along in your pew Bible, that is page number 985. Page number 985. But while you're turning there, uh, I want to say thank you for uh, listening and receiving Jonathan Hamilton last week. I, I've heard some good reports. Uh, I was listening to his sermon as we were coming back from Ohio yesterday, and then my internet cut out, so I didn't get to finish it. But uh, hopefully today I'll get to finish hearing his sermon, so I'm thankful to him, thankful for you, uh, and I'm especially thankful today for Brother Don Deal and his willingness to, to preach as we were coming back from vacation. And so uh, I'd ask you to give him, I know you will, your, your utmost attention and respect. He has faithfully served this church uh, long before I was here and much longer than I have. So I'm very thankful for Brother Don. If you are there in Colossians 4, would you stand, please? To honor God's word, page 985, Colossians 4. We're going to read the whole last chapter. If you'd follow along, please. Masters. Treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open for us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am prisoner, I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. The word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. You all seem like a kind of a sober bunch today. Let, let me give you a little uh, lightheartedness for, for a moment to kind of, before I get serious myself. Got a couple questions for you. What do snowmen eat for breakfast? Frosted flakes. Frosted flakes, that's a good one. What do snowmen wear on their heads? Ice, ice caps. Uh -huh. What nickname can you call a snowman in the summertime? Puddles. Puddles. Where does a snowman keep his money? Snowbank. Snowbank. There you go. That's sharp people. What do snowmen eat for lunch? More frosted flakes. What was the other one? Yeah, that's a good one. The answer I have is icebergers. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, give her in your Bibles, please, in uh, Colossians 4. 
Let's have a word of prayer first. Gracious Father, I thank you for the privilege of speaking and sharing your word. I ask, Father, that you help me to keep it clear and simple and to the point. In Jesus' name, amen. Long time ago, I used to take canoe trips way up in Boundary Waters of Minnesota. Fabulous places to go. But before you get on, get, get on the trail, you take your big old maps and you lay them out across to your hood of your car or wherever you got someplace flat and you're looking for the lay of the land. Where does this particular river go? Where's the pathway go? Uh, am I on certain pathway? And some of the paths were very skinny, very narrow, and you didn't know whether you're on walking on the people path or the path made by the deer or the moose that you saw tracks in the mud. Uh, but you, you spread the map out and you make a plan of attack. You, you lay out the land of what to do. We do the same things today with a whole variety of things. Maybe you check your particular lake and you, you go to the place where your, your favorite fishing hole is at. Or maybe a salesman looks at a certain area to, for sales. Or maybe a business wants a new location. They check out the area. And you can use the same blade of the land in a variety of ways. Our sovereign God, our Father in heaven, knows the spiritual lay of the land. Christ is the head of the church in Colossians 1.18. Our Lord wants us to take heed to the ministry, about the last verse that Pastor read. We need to determine the resources and strength that we have as a church family and, and what gifts God has given to us and put it all to work. Look at chapter, year, chapter 4, look down at verse 17. That's where the title of the message comes from, Take Heed to the Ministry. Paul has been talking to these different individuals. He gets down to the very end and he's dealing with a church in Laodicea, which had its own troubles. And then he talks to a particular man there, Archibus, and he says, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This is a command. It's the last command of the book. And as we look at it carefully, you say, okay, take heed to the ministry. What, what ministry are we talking about? Well, if you just... just just hit the, the man-made title scattered through the Colossians. you got uh, uh, talking about their faith in Christ and the preeminence of Christ and reconciling to Christ, not a philosophy of Christ. And it's, he, he, it's all Christ. That's where the ministry is at. And he tells us to take heed. And the idea is to, to discern something mentally, to, to grab a hold in such a way you've weighed the thoughts carefully and you've examined them carefully. Take heed. Take heed to what? He says ministry. Ministry. We have a way of magnifying that word in our culture, I guess. But ministry is simply an area of service. The people who closed the, uh, cleaned the building yesterday and cleaned the bathrooms, that's a ministry. I'm up here in front of you trying to share the word of God. It's a ministry. It's all, all, all on the same level at the foot of the cross. So ministry is a service. It takes a servant's heart. Someone who works under authority. Then he uses another word. He says receive. You've received this ministry from or in the Lord. No other place, but your ministry is to serve in the context of the Lord. That word receive has the idea of, of taking it to yourself. Make it your own. I served in for one month in Lisbon, Portugal several years ago, and we were at a mission center in a building and a school for the, all that type of thing. But the director took us around the building. There were four of us that went there to, to labor and to work. We were required to uh, uh, work 20 hours per week per person, and the rest of the time you can do what you'd like, or if you want to work for 40 hours, that's fine. But what, what was happening was that the director told us, if you go around the facility, if you see something that needs to be done, own it. Make it yours. Get, get it done. The guy had hardly said that out of his, got the words out of his mouth, and, and uh, the, the, pa the pastor's wife that was with us, uh, um, the first thing she saw was <laughs> dried up plants scattered up and down the stairway. That was, she owned it. She went and watered all those things for a month <laughs> to make sure they stay alive. But that's the idea. You see a need, you own it. You see a need, you get up and do it. Now, with that, he said, now you've received this ministry, 
and he wants you to fulfill it. <clears throat> Not just sit there and think about it, but put some action to it. The word fulfill has two, two sides to it a little bit. One is to promote something, to supply it liberally, to, to, to like a coffee cup, you fill it to the brim. It also has the idea of, to, of performing, where you carry out an idea, you, you go to the very end to accomplish what you're trying to get a hold of. So, what we have here now is a statement from the Apostle Paul directed to a particular minister, but he says, take heed to the ministry that you received in the Lord and fulfill it. Now, I would like to propose to you or suggest to you this morning that the outreach of any church, ours or any other church, depends on the priorities of that church and its leadership and its members. I need to put a disclaimer in there. <clears throat> As I say this, I'm not making a criticism toward pastor, just so you understand. As a church, church family, we're in a position to follow leadership and, and, and members being on, on, on the right path, so to speak. We're to discern the lay of the land. Uh, for example, I bumped into one church a bunch of years ago. They had chosen in their missionary giving to hit that what they call the 1040 window, which is around the globe is the area where most of the uh, Muslim faith is located. They, that was what their, their goal was. I knew of another little church out in the country. They had very little to draw on, and they decided to develop a tract printing ministry. They could do that in their little bitty framework. There are churches like that taking care of different types of needs all over. Now, the Apostle Paul in Colossians 14 reveals several priorities that are concerning how to take heed to the ministry. I direct your attention to three of these this morning. One is their dynamic and they're crucial, dynamic, that they're full of that Holy Spirit energy. They're crucial because they come from the cross. That's where crew comes from. It's a Latin word for, for crux, for the, for the cross. It's painful. Maybe bloodshed. You don't know. I'm horrified at the information I get of, of other Christians, other parts of the world that are suffering so terribly. Anywhere from starvation to being hacked together apart with machetes and who knows what. Gruesome to think about. But in directing your attention to these dynamic priorities, I'm hoping and desiring that this will not only challenge my heart, but yours as well. I'm praying that it fits just right in your heart and that these priorities may be something that help you to walk in your life in a closer relationship with the Lord so that this prayer fits just right for you it's a, and, and a practice these particular priorities, that you may walk closer to the Lord, that you can walk spiritually hand in hand with the pastor and heart to heart with the Lord. That's where the laborers increase because they're walking with the Lord. The three priorities this morning are these. One, cultivate a prayer relationship with purpose. Cultivate a prayer relationship with purpose. The second one is to cultivate a public testimony with wisdom. Cultivate a public testimony with wisdom. <clears throat> Number three is to cult cultivate a pastoral partnership with knowledge. Cultivate a pastoral partnership with knowledge. As I worked on this particular message and trying to get the thought across that I wanted to get across, I was using the word established. For, for, like the first one would be to um, establish a prayer relationship. I thought, no, we, we already have the prayer time, the prayer meeting, the individual prayer. We're not, we're not starting something new. We're taking what we have as old and a little bit used or not, maybe not enough, but we're trying to cultivate it. You stir it up. I remember back as a little boy, my grandfather was a farmer. He had a nice tractor for his day. Now, now to, it, based on the tractors I've seen nowadays, he, his is a toy. <laughs> but it worked. But it took a skill to drive that thing. You go out and plow a field with, I don't know, about six rows at a time, and keep it dead straight. He had to concentrate. 
He, when it was all done, he had to seed it. When it was all done, he had to make sure the fencing was up so the cattle wouldn't get into some of those areas. It was the kind of thing that he had to cultivate it, the lay of the land, in order to get a crop. We need to do that as a church family, to cultivate the lay of the land and see what's out there and say, Lord, I do anything you want me to do. That's the ministry. That's the service. All right, number one. You've got part of that filled out already. Cultivate a prayer relationship with purpose. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 2, I need to let you know that I'm using a new King James. It's a sanctified version, but you know. So if you see a slight different word, you'll understand what it is. It's, it's super close. All right. He says, continue earnestly in prayer. That's a command. It's almost a prayer request, if you want to put it in those terms. I was reading about some climbers in Switzerland. They were climbing the, the, the cliffs of, of um, the Matterhorn, a very hard thing to do. And as they were climbing, they're on a long, long ridge, and the guide heard some noise, and he looked up, and he saw in the distance a gust of vicious wind coming down right toward them. And he had enough time to yell to the people following, get on your knees, get on your knees. It's the only place that's safe. Get on your knees. They were, in essence, hugging the mountain and let the wind go on by. But that's what we need for this idea to continue as, as a command. It means to hold with strength. It means not to neglect it. It's getting on your knees and keeping it strong. Then he uses the word prayer. He uses it twice in verses 2 and 3. They are two different words. Very, very close to meaning, but some, a little bit of distinction that helps him stand out in this passage. One is this. He talks in verse, verse 2. He says, concern... Continue earnestly in prayer. Okay. That particular word for prayer is dealing more with the idea of a designated place. Maybe you have a special place that you like to go to be quiet before the Lord, spend time in prayer and, and, and scripture reading. You may have the closet to go into. It's totally quiet. I read years ago of the, I think it was Charles Wesley. His mother had 11, 12 Children had no private time. Uh, we'll, we'll reflect on pastor for a second. Uh, that's got to be a busy time. But w when the family saw her go get a blanket and put over her head, she could sit right in the middle of the room. They knew that was her quiet time. Don't bother her. The rest of the world was buzzing around, but she needed that time. Now, he, t he uses the different places, use different words. My Bible says vigilant. It's the idea of being wakeful. And I skip myself a little bit. Uh, verse 2 is dealing with a designated place, a place to pray. Verse 4, chapter 4 and verse 3, it says it's more of a practice of prayer. It's the idea of individual, even corporate prayer. It's expressing the ideas of worship. It's sometimes used with, uh, with a feeling behind it that you take all your prayer requests, if you will, and you take them and you put them on the altar, the serious place. You're meeting with God. We're never to let a weariness or a callousness come into our prayer life. It's something that's very, very vital. I think as Paul wrote this, he may be reflecting back to the, the three disciples that went to sleep on Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Or the whole bunch going to sleep in particular at Gethsemane before the crucifixion. You don't go to sleep. You serve the Lord. You don't let it get callous. <clears throat> now, Luke 18, 1 says, uh, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up. Uh, I like a little acrostic that I bump into and use every once in a while. It's push, P-U-S-H, like you push open a door. But I'm dealing with an acrostic idea that you pray until something happens. You pray until something happens. 
he moves on from there, watching in the same width of thanksgiving. I run into an author that said this thanksgiving was, a, he, he explained it this way, you inhale prayer and you exhale thanksgiving. You walk with the Lord and then you reach others. In that thanksgiving, God answers our prayers. Yes, no, wait. Sometimes the Lord gets in a hurry. I was spending time in prayer on New Year's Day, wondering if, if I, I should be pre pre filling in for pastor because of all the travel. And I got Thursday morning, and it was like, yes, do it. Do it now. So he, he agreed. Anyway, this Thanksgiving has the concepts of, of humility going with it. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open the door, and there's a thanksgiving there. I was reading a little book a long time ago called Humility, True Greatness. I forgot the name of the author. He's fairly popular back in the day. But humility to him and that thanksgiving factor, he had three things that he mentioned in his book. One was reflect on the wonders of the cross. If you need something to be thankful for, reflect on on the wonders of the cross. When I was young, we used to sing a hymn <clears throat> that goes this way, first verse. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gains I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. He reflected on the wonders of the cross. He said, acknowledge your dependence on God. <clears throat> If you ever had that sense, you can do it. I remember one time I got into a whole lot of sin problems years ago, and I felt like the Lord telling me, Don, you got to get out of this. You can't do this. And I remember saying to myself, I can handle it. Uh -uh. you got to be dependent. <clears throat> be dependent on the Lord. And then he said the last thing was to express your gratitude to God. Now, in this short thing, we've cultivated a prayer relationship with a purpose, a purpose to continue in strength, a place to pick a place to pray and to pray intently, to, to watch in thanksgiving and be alert to anything that gets you away from the Lord and, and let that thankful heart bring you to a point of, of, of humility. Now, if all that's working, I'm going to sh put these little stickers on the wall behind me. And they all stayed, thankfully. The first set of stickers I put up there, they tried to fall down. <laughs> But what I have in front of me, or behind me, is a sticker that says Pastor Dave on it. The rest of those stickers are, are you, or another church family. I'd like you to imagine that up behind these stickers is some of that netting you buy for a garden. It's, it's, it's real fine nylon stuff. It's, it's, it, if you get a black one, it almost disappears. Well, pretend one of those are up here. And these little tags up here are stuck to that, as well as pastor in the middle. Each one, rep the whole thing represents a church family. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> over here, I've got Charlie. Charlie's just an ordinary Christian. He does support his pastor and lo loves him and all that, but Charlie got kind of lazy in his prayer work, his prayer time. He didn't, he wasn't really supporting pastor. He was there, but not really supporting a pastor. Over here, there's Sally. Sally doesn't have all these things going for her like she should be in prayer for the pastor and all that. She's a gossip. If anybody needs to know something in the church family, she knows and spreads it. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. The support for pastors is starting to dwindle. Another guy comes along in the church and his name is Steve. Steve is a divorcee gotten his life straightened out, Mar married another lady. 
his ability to spend time with the Lord, uh, it, it, things got complicated because you get blended families. And I'm not a, we live with that. It's all over us. But it hurt him spiritually to be a support for the pastor. Gretchen up here. She liked to hang on to her money. She was greedy in that sense, and the idea of tithing just kind of gritted on her. So she, when you got those kind of things working on you, you don't, you don't really feel like walking with the Lord. You don't really feel like being supportive to the pastor. So her support was, was gone. That gentleman was Mark. Mark was an athlete, strong, weightlifter, football player, worked out in the gym. His thighs are so big and strong and muscular that he couldn't find pants to wear. These people have kind of disappeared. <clears throat> What's left? Pastor Dave. And he's just barely hanging on. Years ago, I got out of school, began serving in the church, and for the first time after all that training, I realized that the pastor was, if you will, the center of the bullseye for any kind of satanic disruption in the church ministry. And when that takes place, it fell off. Good timing. So you can take all these things here to commit yourself <clears throat> to a prayer relationship with a purpose. And in that purpose and in that doing, it would go to the next point down, letter B, a concern for purpose. The first thing you put in there in one of your blankies is a door for the word. A door for the word. Revelation 3 and verse 7 and 8, it talks about God opening a door and no man can close it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12 talks about an open door in Troas. Here Paul is praying for an open door at Colossae. That open door means they're looking at the possibilities. They're looking at the preparation. They're looking at the progress of what they had to get it done. This is considering every aspect of ministry to be a door for God to open. You don't force a door. You let God open it. Years ago, I was preaching in a little church in Iowa. And uh, I was just learning about them, and, and they took care of the morning service and Sunday school and and but they didn't have a service at night. They used that particular time for their situation to bring in an Awana group, a children's ministry, and they did well at it. But one of the ladies in the church noticed that at, during the time they were working with the children, there were several moms outside sitting on the steps, and this is summertime, and, and that kind of thing, and it dawned on her, I said, wait a minute. She went and asked the ladies, would you ladies like to have a Bible study while you're waiting for the children? Yes, yes. She saw the opportunity. God opened the door, and they went with it. So you be alert to where God is, is working. Uh, a friend of mine on the phone talked to me the other day, and he said, uh, wherever you see God, he, he bought a quote from a, a book. I think it's Experiencing God. He said, if you sense God is working on a situation, don't stand there and look at it. Pile on. Get in there and get busy. The purpose is a door for the word. And we, once God opens the doors, you pray that God would keep the doors open. Number two there, you can de declare. Declare the mystery of Christ. That's a proclamation. That's announcing the truth. That doesn't mean you have to be a, have a pastor with several pieces of paper hanging on the wall to prove they had the education. If you know one verse of the scripture, John 3, 16, you can talk to people about Christ. I've never forgotten about the first chapel session I went to for when I went to seminary. Uh, one of the men stood up. They're giving testimonies. The guy was a, already a lawyer. 
but he got it worked in his heart and he's back toward ministry. He said in his testimony that God used 50% of what he knew to talk to the first person about the Lord Jesus Christ. One of those verses was John 3.16. That's all he knew. He knew enough to receive Christ as his Savior, but he didn't know, any, know much more than that. He became a good leader as time went by. Declare the mystery of Christ. It's a proclamation. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, for, the, for, for Paul, the word was the cross of Christ. If you study 1 Corinthians 1.17 and following through the area, it's a fascinating piece of scripture. A lot of key words. But the idea you declare the ministry. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, talks about knowing only Jesus Christ and him crucified. Number three. You can put the word drop. He wanted to drop those chains. Maybe a more modern word would be to delete and get rid of those chains. But that's what he wanted. He was in prison. He had those chains around him. And it occurred to me, you don't... My imagination is putting myself in where Paul was at in prison. He talked about being in chains. I don't know if he had his wrist chained together or just a, a ball and chain on his foot, but wherever that metal thing was, he, it was chafing. It had to be painful every day. Remember my chains, he said. I want to drop them. At the same time, he knew that that was opportunity to share the gospel. And he did, he did that same thing over in Philippians chapter 1. Number four here, you can put a display, display of the truth. The power of God is being magnified. Romans 1, 16 tells the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So we have a, a, a lot crammed in here and just a few words we can meditate on. Cultivate a prayer relationship with purpose. I would like you to do something for me. I'm going to repeat that, and I'd like you to say it out loud with me. Ready? Cultivate a prayer relationship with purpose. I'm hoping that sticks in your mind and works its way into your heart. All right. Number two. Cultivate a public reputation with wisdom. And that's in verses five and six. Verse 5 says, walk in wisdom for my, what does the ESV say? I was going to look it up and forgot to. Conduct, yes, okay. He uses the word to walk. It has the idea of your, your pathway through life uh, is, is a concept behind it. But he, if we're going to cultivate a reputation with wisdom, we need to look at our walk, where we are going. I'm going to give you, I didn't write them down for you, but I'm going to give you a, a quick set of words starting with letter A, our walk. It's an assignment to us. It's something where we need to have an approval rating, so to speak, and, and get, get things going. It's our reputation. The second thing, we have an advantage. We have an advantage because, we're, we, we, because of the wisdom of the word of God. James chapter 1 and verse 5 tells us to pray for wisdom. If you're going to pray for wisdom, you should recognize that you don't have it, that you're a little behind the eight ball, and that you need to humble yourself down to the point where you say, okay, God, I, I, I need this prayer. We also have an adversary. Satan is a liar and the father of it, John chapter 8. He wants to distract us from our delight in God, and that started way back in Genesis 2 and 3. But we have an advocate. <clears throat> that advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous, in John, 1 John 2, 1. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us that casting all our cares upon him, for he cares for you. I've shared these already. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And our speech or our preaching is in demonstration of the spirit and power. Then he uses the phrase, around the church. He uses the word outside. I use around just to play with my letter A. 
But this is outside the church. There are saved people. There are people that are unsaved. The unsaved need to get the gospel to them so they understand and can receive Christ as Savior. The saved ones outside the church family are basically disobedient before God. They need to be part of that corporate group. The unsaved, we can recognize them quite easily. But sometimes the saved are outside the church family and the church thing. They got, as we say, got a burr under their saddle. Somehow, some way, they just can't keep things going the way they should. But then he tells us at the end of this thing, the redeeming the time. You're arresting the time for the best use. You're taking what God has given to you to use your time and your talents and your physical being. That's our walk. There's a lot in that walk. The next part, letter B in your outline, is to his speech, our talk. We've got our walk. We've got our talk. He's talking about speech that is... It has grace to it, a speech that is in control, a speech that is used for God's glory and not cursing someone out. I've never forgotten a man that I had (coughs) served as a deacon with him. And one day in my painting, he showed up at the same place that I was working because he worked on a different, different skill level, electrical or something, I forgot what. But something went wrong. He was down the hall around the corner, and I heard this big blankety blank. And I, okay, brother, you 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 need some help. Uh, his reputation to me just went down the tube. He told me that he was hiding in a church and didn't really serve the Lord the way he should. We need to arrest the time, and we take our 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 talk. We're seasoned with grace. It says with salt. Salt is a preservative. Uh, we're preserving the gospel message. It has the answers. He helps us to el- this. Our talk should help us eliminate hindrances to the gospel. Should help us accept the truth of the salvation, and it should help us produce opportunities to demonstrate the love of God. Our walk and our talk are a public reputation that we need to do with wisdom. You probably heard this illustration, but if I had a wet sponge up here, it wasn't totally dripping, but it was good and wet. And that's you. And if I can come down and grab a hold of you with, with, with spiritual grip and squeeze you, what's going to come out of you? Love? Anger? What's going to come out of you? It could be a, a complaints and anger and arrogance and on it goes. But Galatians 5 tells us it should be fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, great gentleness, self-control. That's what should come out of us when we get into rough situations. Godliness. Now, repeat with me again out loud in the name of the, the, the point. Cultivate. Ready? Cultivate perfect reputation with wisdom. Does your reputation where you work need some adjustment? I've never forgotten that one of the major companies I work for. I was about 20 years old. Everywhere I went was pornography plastered up all over the walls. That was bad news. It has a way of working on you whether you like it or not. Okay, that's our walk and our talk. Number three, cultivate a pastoral partnership with teamwork. Just some observations quick. A church health controls our outreach. If you're kind of sick at heart, you're not going to get that gospel out. If you're bubbling in Christ, it's, it's easy. Thessalonians tells us that in every place your faith to God was spread abroad. That was a requirement that they had a faith that was spread abroad. Now, you have some notes for you in your and I just typed them all out. I'm going to read them a little bit. There's a teamwork versus being a lone wolf. 
You work together or you wander alone. Many, many years ago, I was barely out of school and serving in a small church. And I wanted God to be glorified in, in, in every way I could think of. I worked hard on a message, worked hard on a physical thing that had to be done. And one day I was in the church basement around the corner near, near a classroom, and I, a, lady, a couple ladies were talking. And I perked up and said, don't worry about it. Pastor Deal will do it. I was teaching my people not to glorify God, but to glorify me. I thought, no, that can't be. It changed my whole approach to ministry, that people needed help to do their responsibilities, not just some pastor come back up and they drop the ball here. Here comes Don, run over to pick up the ball. No, no. Uh, you walk over and find out why they dropped the ball. You walk over and say, can I, you need help with taking care of this, or whatever way you want to phrase your questions. They need to be kept in the game. They need to be serving where they had volunteered to. They don't need to have a, a, a pastor want to be glorify God and bump her out of her job. No. They need to serve correctly. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Not just one, but all of us. We are to produce as a team or promote tension in the family of God. When the tension's there, it's defeat. I've seen several churches over my lifetime not function together. One church in particular was my home church. Three deacons were at odds with each other and didn't work very good. Church is shut down, long since gone, and all three are dead. The next thought I want to share with you as I bring things to a close this morning is a partner in the gospel. Partner in the gospel. When you use the word partner, what do you think of? Two people working on a project together? Just friends? Partner. Its original use was a nautical term, a sailor's term. What they did when they built those big sailing ships back in the day they put those huge masts from the center of the ship and it goes all the way up. Big, big, huge mast. Okay, all by itself, it's going to do this whiplash number and eventually break. They would take other beams just like it and, and they would put those beams side by side and they'd strap them with heavy ropes all the way around the, the, the first main, main, main mast boat. <clears throat> But they were not just little short ones. They would go up almost halfway or better of the original mast. And then they'd do that again, another, another row of beams in each layer is getting a little bigger and fatter and taking up room. But what it did is gave that mast up there strength to catch the wind and to go where they wanted to go. We can partner in the gospel or you can pester from the pew. I've never forgotten a couple of, I was an assistant pastor, and one of those, a husband and wife team that just totally enjoyed being uh, the power brokers in the church. They'd split anything they could split if it would help them feel good about themselves somehow, some way. You can partner with the pastor or you can partner with disaster. Repeat with me the, the main title of verse, Cultivate. Ready? Cultivate a pastoral partnership with teamwork. All right. I'm going to bring things to a close. We've got communion here. And uh, let me gather up my, my stuff for a few seconds. But you put all those different priorities together. And they're all functioning. And I'd like you to notice very quickly that Paul didn't use very many words to get all this across. He, he has a unique way of putting a lot in to one word. The rest of that sheet, the back side of the notes I gave you, is a listing of all the men involved in the rest of the chapter. There's nine of them. 
It's about half and half, if you will, of Jew and Gentile, if you can watch all the little tiny keywords. You have men there that Paul himself was a major writer for scripture. Luke is in this group. He wrote Acts and, and the book of Luke. Mark was in here. He wrote the gospel of Mark. And these were, these were men that didn't need to be told this truth that Paul was giving to them. But at the same time, they needed that kind of reminder. They needed that kind of truth to be working in their hearts and lives. Cultivate. Whatever God gives to you, work with it. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank thee and praise thee for your great love. I thank you, Father, that you give us uh, guidelines in Scripture to, to follow you. We can put it in our own ideas and make it come out to um, understand it. But I pray, Father, you would help myself to cultivate all the different responsibilities that come my way and that, Lord, you would be glorified the right way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Don. That's a lot of truth for us to chew on and to put into practice. Very kind of him to put over half of it on the paper for us. A good study sheet for you this afternoon. Take with you this week. Well, as we ponder those and as we turn to the communion table, take your insert out of your bulletin. Uh, Jesus lives and so shall I. Death, thy sting is gone forever. When you have that, would you stand with me and let's sing together. All six verses.
time. And the deacons come forward as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. We have reviewed this passage each time, and I will go over it again. There is so much instruction in Paul's address to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I just want to focus here in, in verse 17 and following. Paul writes, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. The body was not functioning as the body. It wasn't helping and healing. It wasn't restoring to life. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it, in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Paul knew about the situation in Corinth. They're, they were acting in ungodly ways. He wanted the genuine among them to be recognized. When you come together, he says that again, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. One of the purposes, there are many, one of the purposes of us celebrating together the Lord's Supper is to show the unity of the body of Christ. We are one. Yes, we are also many. If you look around this room, no two of us look alike. Not even the twins. But we are one. God has made, has made us each differently and uniquely. And he's gifted us uniquely. But if we are in Christ, you are a part of this church. We are one. And this is a time for celebrating not our differences. Everyone comes into the church, the universal church, the same way. By the blood and body of Jesus Christ. By trusting in his work on the cross to save you and me from our sins. There is no other way you are right with God. And thus it is only his followers who should partake in this meal. If you have not yet repented of your sins, for your sake, we ask that you would just refrain and, and watch and learn and listen and consider. Because what we are celebrating is what Jesus Christ has done for his children. For those who have received the gift of his body and of his blood for our payments, payment to God for our sins. But this is not just to celebrate the universal church, though that exists and that is real. And one day we will gather together. When do we gather together here on this earth in the universal church? We don't. Sometimes we don't even know who is in and who is out. But we have covenanted, covenanted together here at Christ Church. We've, we've agreed on doctrine. We've agreed on a covenant. We've been baptized and, and have shown visibly what the Spirit of God has done internally, invisibly in us. And so if you are a member of Grace Church, I'd invite you to participate. If you are not a member, but you're considering the process, you're, you are in the process or in considering, we invite you to participate as well. If you are a Christian, but you have not joined with the church, and you have no intentions of joining the church, I'd warn you to stop and consider as well. Mr. Deal shared, you can be a lone wolf or you can join the team. And so this is, do you hear how many times he says it? For when you come together, in the first place, when you come together, when you come together, he says it three times in those short verses. This is for the body of Christ and those who covenant together. So if you're a member of Christ, member of this church, if you're a member, if you're visiting with us and you're a member of another Bible preaching church, we welcome you to participate. This is not just for Grace Church. And if you haven't joined, if you're, you're in the process of that, 
we invite you to join as well. The only concern is for the person who says, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm just not in his church. That is uh, an anomaly that does not exist in any way. So let me pray, and let's prepare our hearts to receive this Advent. Gracious Father, giver of all good things, giver of the best thing, your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the gift of your Son. Thank you that he averted from men the wrath of God, that he bore our punishment on his body on the tree. So, Father, with joyful hearts, not as perfect hearts yet, but as those who have repented and trusted in the work of your Son, Father, we do now celebrate him and the sacrifice he made. Receive this, our worship. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Church, let's eat together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread. blood that was shed. Your word says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no payment for sin. Jesus shed his precious blood to pay for our sin. To propitiate, to stand in between us and the wrath of God. Thank you, Father, for this great gift.
This is the cup and the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. I should ask you when you're done, just take these out. There's a trash can right around the corner there. Both restrooms have trash cans. If you want to walk all the way around to the back, you can go to another trash can. Children, you've done a great job. Good job sitting quiet. This is a this is a joy, but it's not a happy birthday fireworks jump on the trampoline kind of joy. Okay, those are good joys too. This is a somber joy. This is a serious joy. Because the God of the universe allowed son would be killed for your sin and for mine. So some joys require sober reflection, quiet time, and this is one of them. He says at the end, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are celebrating a death. We don't do that. But this is the death that he celebrates. And it causes us to look forward when Jesus will come back. Not bloody, not a corpse, but in a white robe with blazing eyes on a white horse and with a sword to devour his enemies. He is coming. So we will sing our closing song as we look to and celebrate the return of our king. Let's pray and then we will we will stand and sing together for all the saints. Father, again we thank you for the death and of your son. We thank you for his resurrection. We thank you for his present intercession and we thank you for his soon coming kingdom. Let us celebrate go here this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymn books if you would. Turn to hymn number 418. Also, grab your inserts. The music is on 418. Your inserts will be here. Our deacons will pass uh, our offering plates for our deacons' offering. And let's stand and sing and give together as we, as we close. <laughs>
Amen and amen. We have been fed well. I will always, always take a challenge to prayer uh, any day of the week because I know I need it. Thank you, Brother Don. And kids, I'd be happy to see your pictures, but I'm sure Mr. Deal would too and might even take a hug too. So why don't you stop by him before you get to me. But thank you for worshiping with us. We'll take a 15-minute break here. And if you would uh, stay for the CE hour, we will have a, a great discussion on some of the creeds that have shaped the Christian faith. God bless you. You are dismissed. Go in peace. Thank you.